Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined today over Google Hangout with Tony Stubblebine. Tony, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to chat with the Buddhist geeks. Yeah, thank you for having me. Love to be here. Hello, Buddhist geeks. Nice. And um, just just a little bit of background before we jump into our conversation. Uh, Tony is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Lyft, uh, which produces the Lyft app, uh, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And before that, you also started a company called Crowdvine, which I uh, I remember using it for a little while. Uh, it was like an event, um, like sort of an event yep. type of program. Yeah. Um, so so you've been sort of uh, in the entrepreneurial sort of Silicon Valley world uh, for for a while. It sounds like. Yeah, for a while, I actually my co-founder of this company and I got started in the Midwest. We were working uh, for Mastercard, and we. Like I think we both came to the conclusion that we wanted to do really meaningful work, and so both of us came out here separately and started working for startups. Actually, and before I started my own companies, I worked for other startups. I would work for a podcasting startup, um, mm. which is actually uh, um, ended up doing one significant thing, which is it's this company that Twitter spun out of. So I'm also the sixth user of Twitter, and um, and then nice. eventually, you know, felt like. I had my own ideas and I wanted to I wanted to work on them and that's one thing I like about Silicon Valley is there's a a lot of support for you know going out and doing creative things. Yeah. So so you worked at Odeo it was Odeo, uh, the company that spun out Twitter, is that right? Yeah, this yeah, this podcasting sort of Odeo. Um, yeah, Silicon Valley is crazy in the like just you know a lot of ideas get tried and a lot of times they fail, but the thing that makes it all work is the the people and the connections they have. So it's actually, while I didn't go and stay with Twitter, I kept in touch with the um, my boss at Odeo, Evan Williams, who went on to be the one of the founders and CEO of Twitter. And it's actually, he was our first investor and he co-designed Lyft with me. Um, and it's one of those Silicon Valley stories where if you just you just keep in touch with your friends and you might go through a, a lot of companies, but eventually you get a chance to work together again. Mm, that's cool. I mean, and as you probably know, Buddhist geeks is sort of a mashup in some ways of uh, sort of Buddhist culture and practice with geek culture and practice, and obviously Silicon yeah. Valley being one of the the kind of uh, the epicenters of geek culture. Probably, I guess I guess you could safely say it's the epicenter at the moment of geek culture in the world. Um, obviously that's changing and there's a lot of different amazing places to be in the startup scene and be w working on creating new things. Um, but let's let's turn our attention to Lyft. Sure. Uh, I want to talk about Lyft because th this is an app that I've been using for I think the past year or so and I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I really enjoy it. It's It's got a really simple interface. It's designed uh, to sort of help develop and track habits, uh, certain habits. So immediately I thought, oh, this could be a way to support developing certain habits that are related to my contemplative practice, to my you know, health, just things that I'm focusing on trying to be consistent with, like meditation or exercising, you know, simple things. But um, I found it to be a really helpful and useful uh, tool. So I wanted to see if we could sort of explore a little bit about Lyft and, and what is Lyft. Uh Right on. I love that you're an active user and that it's helped you. It, it's it's definitely one of my, like, probably the top goal I had in starting a second company was to do something where I felt like we were making a positive impact on the world. So to have this conversation with you and to say, and to hear you say that, you know, it helped you and, what, and worked for you, that's what makes the work fulfilling for all of us at this company. Um, and so, I mean, going back, the history of Lyft is I I was looking for something, a second thing to do, and kind of really just um, thinking, investigating my own desires and who I, who am I, what am I interested in, and what I came to is the thing I've always been interested in is how do people achieve their goals? Like I, you know, I grew up a sports fan. And then I got into Silicon Valley, and then I was a fan of entrepreneurs and top programmers, and it just—it's much broader than that. Even I'm almost—I'm—I'm 
I, I'm always interested to talk to someone, and because what you always he, what you almost always hear from them is that there was a process that that they followed to get from a beginner to an expert. So normally, when you see an expert, they're so far beyond what you know you could even contemplate doing. You there you project onto them a level of genius. But the reality is almost always that. It was a long period of deliberate practice, and so I thought if we could help expose that and help support that, we could create a system where a lot more people reached expertise in whatever it is that they were they were interested in. Okay, awesome. And then in terms of the mechanics of how it works, like could you say a little bit about uh, how the how the app functions and and how it does that? Sure. I mean, we're mostly focused on creating a positive reinforcement loop so that and what we've built it around is a very simple tracking you pick habits that you want to do regularly and you check in every time that you do that and then on top of those check-ins we've built in uh, kind of an accountability system from your friends and other people in the habits with you so when you do check in you get props from people in the in your community is letting you know that you've done you've done a good job. Congratulations for keeping up your progress, and uh, um, you know to cheer you on to to keep doing it. And a lot of the psychology research that we did um, really highlighted the effectiveness of uh, positive reinforcement for behavior change. It helps it helps lock in a behavior so that you're more likely to do it again. And without that, each each time you want to do something, it's a battle between you and your own, you know, your own willpower. And the more you can make something habitual, the less it becomes an internal struggle to do. Okay, that makes sense. And and you actually have some some folks that you're working with. At least one guy I, I saw you mention at Stanford, who's sort of in in this field of, yeah. uh, I guess you call it behavior design or positive reinforcement. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the. The kind of scientific underpinnings of of this, yeah. because you're you're pulling from different theories on this stuff and trying to bake it in, I guess, to the to the to the app. Yeah, you know, there's decades of psychology research, but what they're what's new in psychology right now is a lot of applied psychology research. So we spend a lot of time with Dr. B. J. Fogg at Stanford, who uh, runs a persuasive technology lab there, which is essentially and how can you design technology for behavior change? And what he's really an expert in is creating uh, systems for how to apply uh, all of the research that, that's out there. And um, I almost always go back to him when I'm, when I'm explaining how it is that Lyft works. And the model that he gives primarily, like anyone can use this model with or without Lyft, it's a great way to think of uh, how to design your own behaviors. He calls it BMAT, and it's essentially in order to get a behavior out of yourself or out of someone else, you need three things to come together. The person needs to be motivated, the person needs to have the ability, and the, per it needs to, the person needs to be triggered. I mean, essentially, you're not going to do something unless it occurs to you to do it. And even then, you're only going to do it if you have the ability to do it and you want to do it. So, you know, like what, what I love about that model is now when I'm looking at a challenge like, oh, I want to exercise every day, I've got, I can just think, well, do I have those three things? You know, does, do, do I, am I a member of a gym? Uh, am I, am I uh, healthy and rested, you know, so that I'm not ditching my gym visit because I'm too tired? And then, you know, do I have t time booked in my calendar so that it actually occurs to me to, to go do that, to go, you know, to go work out? And almost anyone can think about their own goals in terms of uh, those three things. That, you know, certainly meditation, right? It's like, what is the thing that's going to prompt you to meditate in the day? Um, you know, why do you want to m meditate? Be clear on that so that you have motiv motivation for it. And then, you know, I think we'll get into this a little later, but we did a bunch of research into successful meditators, and what we found was that 
the ones who went on to be successful started with very short meditation. And so, to me, that goes back to ability. Like, when you're a beginning, when you're beginning, it's hard. You, not just hard; it's impossible to sit down for an hour and suddenly have a clear mind. Right? Like, <laughs> nobody has that experience. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we when we talk to people who went on to be successful meditators, they were sitting down for like two minutes a day, and that eventually turned into. Lifelong, a lifelong meditation habit. And, and when you say successful, you, you're t talking in terms of being able to create and sustain like a regular practice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, sustain a sustained habit of meditation. That's the other thing that they said in their research, and um, as we did our research, we heard over and over again, was that the habit of meditation was the most important thing for them. Mm. Whether it was a long meditation, a, like whether it felt like a successful focus meditation, like all of those things were secondary to, you know, did they just at least get in a little bit of time each day? That's cool. And and how you did the research? I I remember uh, this last March you had this sort of month long meditation challenge, which was, um, which was great because it seems like a good opportunity to kind of create a container. Okay. For this period of time, we're going to work on developing this yeah. habit. You know, that nothing, nothing particularly new about that. But what I thought was cool is being able to use the app, and then also the kind of data that you guys were collecting and sharing back with the Lyft community. Um, some of what you've already described. There was one piece in particular I thought was cool, which was the uh, um, the metric measuring the likelihood of continuing uh, daily uh, practice or daily meditation, like how you know how many days does it take to the point where it's highly likely that the very, the next day you're going to meditate like 90 plus percent likelihood that you're going to continue to meditate could you say a little bit about what you guys found with that that particular metric and and why you were looking at that um yeah it um it was uh i mean i think it was just fascinating to have have access to people's data there. And you know, when we when we look at behavior design, we look at the what are the barriers the barriers is almost always some level of doubt. And so you know every every additional day is hard uh, when you're creating a new habit and you wonder like will it ever get easier? And so um, and so when you're on day three, and day three is still hard, you might think, oh, it's going to be 100 days this hard. I could never make it. And so it actually, being able to say, like, this is when it, like, it quantifiably gets easier when yes. you get to day 11, I think is a huge uh, reduction in doubt for people going forward with meditation, because then they have a clear goal in their head, and they just they know I'm going to have to exercise a fair amount of willpower for this week and a half, but then it, it will get easier. I know, and you know, I care enough about this habit that I will force myself to get that far into it. Okay, cool. And 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 this is something. This is data that, for instance, I've never seen on meditation. This must be, in some ways, unique data that you're gathering here. Um, I imagine because you've got a pretty big sample size. I mean, something like you know, 25,000 people on the app have chosen the meditation habit. And so yeah. this is very cool. Yeah, thank you. I, this is I mean, one of the, definitely one of the coolest things about Lyft is that we have access to so much habit data right now. And from that, we can uh, get insight into what works and what doesn't work, how hard something is, comparatively how, you know, what, what's, um, uh, how does one thing compare to another. And um, I think this is one of the, the biggest impacts we can have on the world is just to share this data so that people can tackle their, their goals in a, in a smarter way. And so, you know, it's our intention to do this for nearly everything, not just, you know, we've done it for meditation recently, we did it for some, we did some diet research before that, and you know, I think we're going to continue to 
uh, look into you know almost anything that we can. Cool, and and just looping, just to kind of go back to what you're saying before about the this particular metric of day eleven. Um, what well, was so cool to see this chart, which we'll post in the uh, the episode notes, but. Uh, you know, there's sort of this chart, and it's showing okay days on on the sort of x-axis and the y-axis is like the percentage likelihood that you're going to continue to meditate the next day, uh, something like yeah. that. And it's amazing. It it basically starts around 50 percent or so, and then over the course of 11 days, it goes up to around what 90 percent or so, and then it sort of right. stays there uh, afterwards. Like you kind of hit this plateau where it's like it's pretty likely once you've been meditating 11 days in a row. That you're going to meditate the twelfth day and the thirteenth day, um, and, and I thought that right. was pretty interesting. So it, it kind of gives you this sense of okay, if I can just make it, you know, eleven, twelve days, I'm going to be kind of in the sweet spot with respect to having built up a kind of momentum, um, and that's such a big part of developing like any skill, I imagine, but in particular with meditation, is having this kind of momentum that builds and a and, and a quality of Kind of every day, there's something that's be being built on itself, as opposed to having to kind of get the momentum going every single time again. Yeah, that's exactly right, and I think that's the core uh, realization around positive reinforcement when you're when you're going after a goal. Is if you can get some momentum going, everything gets easier. And you know, a lot of people kind of do things that make that impossible. Either you know, they try and do it all at once, right? Like if your goal is to meditate for 60 minutes a day, like, maybe you can do it the first day. But you, it's going to be so hard and such a struggle that it's going to be really unlikely that you're still going to be meditating 60 minutes a day you know, a month later. And um, you know, that, that like, do it overnight instantaneous gratification Mindset, it like often works against you. If you can just, you know, swallow your pride at the beginning, start small. Almost everything once you get, uh, get, get it, can you know get to consistency will eventually expand to you know, whatever your actual end goal is. Okay, cool. That's really cool. And you know, there's this there's this whole movement that many of the geeks listening will will know about, which is the kind of quantified self movement or the QS movement and these are basically folks who got really geeky about tracking right. their behavior and um, wanting to, to sort of quantify it or make it uh, something they could actually see like to actually make it into like a number that they can look at okay this this sort of represents my behavior like the Nike fuel band does or um, like in some ways like Lyft does and I was wondering if you could talk about Kind of how quantified self fits into what you guys are doing, and is that something that is on your radar? Something that you've been learning from? Just kind of the relationship there between between the two. Yeah, quantified self is this amazing movement, um, and I remember the day that we launched the Lyft app. I actually spoke at our local quantified self meetup, and the pitch I made to them was that I thought consistency data was the fundamental data type for quantified self. Because if you think about what a lot of people track in quantified self, it's just not generalizable. Like, I mean, most commonly people track steps. There's all sorts, you know, people wear Fitbits or Nike Fuels or uh, Jawbone Ups, and you know, at the end of the day, they track how many steps that they take in. But that doesn't help me when I go to the gym and I swim. Uh, it doesn't help me when I lift weights, right? Like that particular data type, number of steps taken doesn't translate into all of the other things I want to track. The one thing that you can track that translates to almost any goal or behavior is consistency. And so while it's not, it's not a deep dive into quantifying a behavior, it, is, it has this incredible breadth because it works for uh, so many things. It works for, you know, in Lyft, I think people have created something like 800,000 different habits. And a lot of them are things you'd expect, run, go to the gym, floss, meditate. Um, but a lot of them are really non-standard, like tell my wife I love her, um, don't get a traffic ticket. You know, like this incredible breath that, you know, uh, yeah, I like the, I, I'm happy that when this person gets a streak and don't get a traffic ticket. So the, uh, but and so that's where like all of those things are trackable.
quantifiable or quantifiable in terms of consistency. And you know, clearly, the uh, Nike Fuel Band isn't going to do anything for you know for your relationships. Did you tell your wife that you loved her? Did you spend time with your kids? Um, did you give someone a compliment? Like all of those uh, very important behavior changes that make a big difference to your overall happiness. Uh, those are great just to think in terms of, well, can I do this every day? Can I make this a consistent part of my life? Mm. I have one last question for you that's kind of uh, an exploration of the maybe the dark side or the shadow side of, of, um, of this kind of stuff, and it's something I've seen for myself quite a bit, and I, I see it in certain cultures like Boulder or San Francisco where there's like a lot of, you know, people have a lot of time, they have a lot of affluence, you know, there's a way in which we're, we sort of have, a, like from a Buddhist perspective, we're kind of like in a God realm of some sort. Um, and I'm curious what your perspective on this uh, is. And the thing I've noticed, the thing I've observed is that um, oftentimes we can get in to a mode where because we have the time and opportunity and we start to sort of focus on ourselves, focus on our habits, focus on our practices, focus you know, on kind of being healthy. And there's a way in which that self-focus can kind of become like a kind of self-absorption or a kind of narcissism. And we sort of lose track of what's actually happening outside of these amazing bubbles of I, innovation. I love this question because it's... It <laughs> Okay, it looks like we lost Tony. Uh, I think I cut, I cut out on you guys first. Go, go ahead, go ahead. You're telling me how much you love but the I'm question. Back. But I love this question because it's such a human question, right? It's not, I don't think people are narcissistic because that they're a quantified self. They're narcissistic because they're human, right? And the person who really figured this out first and, and articulated it the best was Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. And so when I look at people's goals, actually, we see a pretty clear like, uh, hierarchy of ambition. Like, the first thing that they work on is, you know, they, like, they feel bad about being overweight, so they try and lose some weight, and they try and exercise more. And then eventually, they start working on enjoying their life more, so like, read more is a popular habit on that. And then, once they feel like they have their life taken care of, you'll see them start to work on their own relationships. So you know, spend time with my kids, or uh, tell my wife I love her. And then, at, and then only at that point, as they're becoming an actualized person at the very peak of the of the triangle, they start to reach out and do things for the outside world. And one of my favorite recent lift experiences was. Uh, a group came through wanting to do acts of good, uh, and they had tied it to, um, uh, they like actually found a sponsor to match acts of good with a donation to uh, uh, a U.S. food bank. And so it actually, and so their, their concept of an act of good was very simple. Like it could be hold the door open for someone, smile at a stranger, uh, let someone merge in front of you in traffic, but that like creates a mindset change in the people doing it, and they start to think differently about their role in the world. And what was cool is, on top of all of that, they found a donor who was would donate basically match every act of good with a dollar donation to this charity, and like the whole thing translated to like if I hold the door open for someone, eight families would get fed. And like it was like it was such a powerful um, and generous uh, concept. Like I love that, but most people they kind of need to work their work way up to it. And so I think quantif I think what's really important is to serve those base needs, which you might think they might look narcissistic at first, but those are required before someone feels you know confident and comfortable enough with themselves. They start reaching out and doing good for the for for other people. Mm, cool. Um, 
you, you mentioned at the beginning that you may have had some questions for me before we wrap up. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to turn the tables on me if you want. If I'm not, doing um, it. it's fine. Here it comes. <laughs> okay, hit me. How can we get more people meditating? It's like meditation completely changed my life. I was so like you know, so just caught up in multitasking. I'd wake up and my phone you know, I'd check my email right away and I'd just be immediately into like a, a thousand different ideas and never really be present for any of them. And meditation trained me to step back and be in the moment. And like I enjoy life more, I'm better at my job, and I you know, I feel like the people around me are probably enjoy interacting with me a lot more too. I mean, it's mm -hmm. so powerful. Even so, yeah. So, what's your take on this? Uh, I'm curious. What? Um, how did you get into meditation? Like, what was the doorway? Was it a particular type of practice, or how did you get into meditation? You know, I I had two entries. One didn't work, and then the other did. And so I had a friend who who just told me he meditates by counting. And so I like the simplicity of it. And I think he counts to like 5,000. It's a lot of time to be counting. I was more like I could handle maybe 200. And I like the simplicity. It travels well. You can do it anywhere. Um, but it was, in some ways, it, it was just too much of a struggle. And then we saw in the Lyft community, this one app in particular, Headspace, kept getting mentioned over and over again in the Lyft meditation community. And so uh, just a couple of us decided to give it a try. What I loved about it is it's a guided meditation. So suddenly all the pressure is off me to do what this person says. And one of the things the person says often is, your mind may have wandered. Totally normal. Let's bring it back to your breath now. And so, like, like all of that struggle that I was feeling, I suddenly felt like it was normal. And uh, you know, all I had to do was turn on this app for a couple of minutes. And I, I thought, it, you know, it also, it did, it did a good job of training uh, and talking about how you can use your new mindfulness skill uh, in everyday life. And so I had a couple of good exam, good experiences where either. Okay, seems like we lost Tony again. I had a couple of good, uh, I had a couple of good experiences where, you know, I was meeting a new person and thinking about the meeting that I had afterwards, and and just realizing, oh wait a second, I have a skill for this. Let me take a deep breath. Let me think about my breath for a second, and then I'll be back with this person. Uh, and I love that. It was so powerful. Yeah. Okay. That's that's helpful. I, I now I have that as context. I could maybe yeah. uh, formulate a little bit of a response. Um, so the question is, how do you get more people meditating? Um, I mean, one thing I've seen uh, since I started practicing is that meditation has become like e exponentially more popular uh, in the last ten or fifteen years. So in some ways, it seems like it's already happening. And it seems like like mindfulness, that term yep. in particular, has got a huge amount of momentum behind it. Um, the thing that we've been sort of focusing on at Buddhist Geeks, or, or I've been focusing on, is kind of also asking the question, well, if, if a bunch more people get introduced to some basic stuff around meditation or, or mind training, um, like what you described, the ability to return to an object and notice that you're wandered and return to an object, you know that that in some ways is a very basic um, meditation skill. Then the question is, where do people go from there? Because from a kind of more of an advanced meditation point of view, um, the process isn't sort of linear for most people, and that it just doesn't keep getting better and better and better. At some point, it's like if you go too far down the rabbit hole with with anything, you start this stuff starts getting weird. And meditation gets very weird for a lot of people because you're essentially investigating your perceptual systems, yeah. And you're investigating at some point if you if you turn just for, from focusing like on the breath and you start kind of like paying attention to okay, 
what is this thought? Where is it arising from? How long does it stay there? How does it present itself? Is it a visual thought? Is it an auditory thought? Is there a sense of uh, is is there a sense of me in that thought? How do I know that I exist based on this thought arising? You know, you start investigating those things. Then very quickly, what I found is uh, reality starts to get deconstructed. Uh, how it's formulated, how it kind of comes together. You start seeing through the cracks of that process. And that's the point at which many people have these big kind of, they usually describe them as spiritual experiences or yeah. insights. And then the, the thing that I found is once someone has had like a big opening or a big experience, then they're in this weird like no man's land afterwards where they don't quite know how to move forward. And a lot of things, like fundamental assumptions they had about their experience and who they were got kind of questioned at a really deep, in a deep way that it's like hard to reconcile. And yeah. I find those people are, once they've gotten into that point of practice, like they need some different framework that's a little bit more complex and nuanced about kind of what are the, the kind of deeper aims of meditation or what could they be if you continued that process of deconstructing so, the self. Sorry, go ahead. That's so interesting because I, I've been promoting meditation to so many of my friends as a very pragmatic practice. Like, you know, I know you care about productivity, you have a hard job, you'd be so much better if you picked this up. That, yeah. That's exactly why I picked it up. But I, I absolutely had these, you know, a few random spiritual experiences that mm -hmm. caught me off guard. And I remember coming back from a re retreat and telling my team, you know, it's like, all right, I'm, I need to tell you what happened at the retreat. Before that, let me preface this by saying, like, I'm the exact same person. I like, I, I still love NBA basketball. I love rap music. I love like working hard and like writing code and making good products, but I had this incredible awakening, and <laughs> I was like, it was hard kind of to match those two things together, and also I felt a little bit like it would be hard for someone else to understand, you know, that uh, that, that might happen because, um, you know, people have their own kind of religious and spiritual systems in place, and um, yeah, that's a often a tricky communication area. Cool, cool. That's interesting. So, so one thing I would think is there's something good about coordinating the you know if there's a funnel, if people find themselves entering meditation and then they go deeper. Not everyone will. I mean, probably most people won't. But if they do end up having like these big experiences and they're and they're trying to like reconcile that and they're trying to figure out, okay, where do I go from here? Like I did. You know, I, I listened to the Headspace app or to another app. I got some yeah. basic instructions, but like, how do I move forward? Um, and I think there are a lot of really amazing people out there that know that territory fairly well of the mind and and can be of service. You know, beyond that point, I think in addition to scaling up the number of people who get introduced, it's useful to scale up and connect those folks who can sort of support people yeah. in going deeper if that's the route they they end up taking. So that that's kind of how I've been thinking about that question. Right. Yeah. That's a great framework. Cool. So do do we have a listener participation now? Uh, yeah, we we have time. Uh, I want to make sure you can get off for your next uh, appointment, but we have maybe an time for one question. If anyone wants to uh, jump in from the Buddhist Geeks community and ask a question of Tony, um, what we'll do is just put a little link on the event page, uh, and you can click it, and then you'll come into the Hangout, and we'll unmute you, and you can ask your question. And I'm not sure how many people are tuning in, so uh, we may or may not have a question, but... And, and by the way, like just going back to your last question, I think I think that's a really, I think it's really important for, diff, you know, people that are coming at these things from different angles to be talking to each other. That yeah. seems like one of the big 
gaps that that I've seen so far in in the popular meditation space is that like having conversations with people that have been doing it for a long time. I think part of the reason is because people have been doing it for a long time get they tend to get really like rigid and dogmatic about the way they do things, so it's kind of tough. So I, I think this is one of the things I'm excited about our role at Lyft is that we're intentionally not the expert. And so we don't have to get dogmatic and we can play more of a curation role, help help connect people. Because we want to help support any advice we're in, we're not prescriptive about that. So I'm, I think I see that in the meditation community on Lyft even, that people are trading, you know, trading tips. So like, I just recommended uh, the Headspace app, but I think a lot of people find that when you get further into the Headspace system, it's too much work. You know, suddenly they're asking you to meditate for 20 minutes a day, and maybe you only have two minutes. And so, I'm seeing more people do a combination of Headspace and this other app, Calm.com, which has like a nice two-minute uh, meditation. And so it's like either you have time for 20 minutes of Headspace, or, but or if you don't, well, here's this other thing that can fill in the gap. There. Like, I like that that trading. I hope we get more experts who, like like you say, can guide you through the 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 trickier, more complicated parts once you get further in. Yeah, and for people that you know they want to go from a few minutes a day to like a half hour to two hours a day, you know, that's like just a different level of practice, you know. Yeah. Like like anything. For sure. Cool, cool. Well, uh, Tony, thanks uh, again for taking the time to, to, to join us over Google Hangout and to talk a bit about Lyft. And uh, for everyone who's got an iPhone and access to the web, I would recommend checking it out. Um, I'm on there. Uh, if you want to see how uh, how infrequently I meditate, you're welcome to follow me. <laughs> and, no, that's great. Uh, <laughs> but so you actually you have a group on Lyft, right? And I feel like we should... Uh, is it, is it mindfulness hacks? Uh, mind um, hacking. Mind hacking. Yes. We, sh um, we should make sure to give people access to that because Lyft is available. I mean, for the web and for um, for iPhone, but that group in particular, I think, would be a good place for you know listeners of Buddhist geeks to you know start and Lyft with a, a community of people that. And have the same reference points and framework of thinking that, that as each other. Yeah, cool. Um, I'll definitely mention the mind hacking group and uh, the group thing is cool. You can sort of uh, join a collection of habits with other people and and sort of form a little group there. So uh, yeah, uh, feel free to join the mind hacking group. We'll uh, I'll put a link on the episode notes for people. All right, awesome. All right, cool, uh, Tony. Thank you, sir. Oh, it was great to to be here and uh, can't wait till you guys get this posted. Cool. All right. All right. Take care. You too. Bye, everyone.